you know, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is that uh, um, we talk about, we are talking about pa turning passion into profession, but my journey has really been about finding that passion. You know, it's really great for some people who feel it and they know this is what you want to do. But for some of us, it's a journey, you know, because we are taught from the time we are kids, you're supposed to feel this way, you're supposed to do this. And how do you, you know, take away all that noise and find that passion and then have the courage to actually follow it? Because it's not easy doing that either. So in some ways, I'll give really quick tidbits of how I arrived at where I am and what we plan to do. In some ways, Singapore kind of played a part in it. In 92, um, I joined Intel and one of the things I got involved in is how to get the whole world to see that laptops are the way to go. I mean, imagine 91, this is like, whatever, how many, 20 years ago. And uh, you know, you have this clunker at your work and you're working on this PC and with the great difficulty, we convinced you, you need PC in your office. And then now we want to tell you that you need to move to something you carry in your hand and you go everywhere with it. People thought we were crazy. So there was a whole bunch of us who were evangelists who would go out and you know, on one hand we are you know, convincing the computer makers that you need to make this. On the other hand, we are going to the end users and saying you need it. And then we are telling the uh, computer manufacturers that the end users really want it. And we are telling the end users that the computer makers are really making it. So we are like, kind of going back and forth. And in 91, we created the first six uh, laptops ever uh, created in this world. And we brought them to a trade show here in uh, Singapore where we first showcased it. And I carried the six laptops with me. And they didn't weigh light, you know. So I had about, what, 40 kgs on top of me. And I was, I was petrified to put them in a suitcase and check it in because it was the only six that existed in the world. And we came to Singapore and that was my, you know, as a young, uh, person, this is like first time I came, got to go to another country and go to a trade show. It's like very exciting times, and I we came here and we were setting up. And I remember the truck driver who pulled over to bring the set, etc., had a cell phone. And in my life, I've never seen a cell phone. And I was like, wow, you know, how many new things are am I seeing in this one trip? And the reason I tell this story is that that exercise is the first time I understood the power of painting a vision. We had nothing. I mean, literally a bunch of us sat around and said, we got to have something that goes with you. We didn't know technically how to make it. We didn't know if it had any relevance. We didn't know what applications would make sense. We didn't know anything. But we said we need to do it. And we said also, within 10 years, this will become the only machine you will carry with you, which is revolutionary to say in those days because desktop was it after a lot of work from us. And uh, so, you know, I, and I still remember coming into the airport, walking in, opening the bag and displaying the six laptops. And ours was the most popular booth in the entire conference because nobody has ever seen anything like this. And what it also taught me is that how much work goes behind the scenes to make a vision come true. We worked for almost five to six years before they actually were, became a mainstream item in the market. And every two years, we used to come up with a new vision and put a whole infrastructure around it. And this is what people don't see in big companies. You see Intel making chips, but the amount of money and resources that are spent in painting a vision and making it happen. So that's the first thing I learned is you must have the courage to paint a vision, but line up with all the right people to make it happen. Otherwise, it won't happen. So we've had equal amount of failures and successes. And what I've seen is that whenever we lined up with the right people, it happened. So um, that's the first lesson I learned. And the second thing I learned, actually, I went to the, my first TED in 1994 in the US. And I couldn't explain to people what it was. It's just that I went there. And for the first time, I felt that this multiple personalities within me kind of came together. Because I think we are forced to learn that we are one thing. What are you? Are you an engineer? Are you a doctor? Are you this? Are you that? But we are many things. I'm a woman. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an executive. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm an enthusiast. I'm an actress. I'm a writer. I'm many, many, many things. But 
Unfortunately, there are 24 hours in a day. We can't do all the things that we want to do. But I think it's important to acknowledge that all these things exist within us and then say, which is the one I love to do the most. And to me, it's been a 20-year journey. It was not overnight. You know, I, was, I worked at Intel. I worked as a venture capitalist. I became a philanthropist because all these sound good. You know, I mean, to be an executive at Intel was really cool. You know, go to travel in first class, stay in really cool hotels and all this stuff. And to be a venture capitalist, to be a female venture capitalist was even more cool. You got to now travel, not business class, but actually first class. And not, you didn't stay in Marriott, you stayed in the Peninsula Hotel. And, you know, somehow investors give you money to do all these things. And, uh, you know, and the more you get caught up in this, the more you get caught up in what you think you're supposed to be and not what you are. And it took me quite a bit of journey to stop and say, in all the things I have done, what is it that I loved doing? And to me, what I loved doing was really living vicariously through others. I love archaeology. I love writing. I love uh, technology. I, and I, I'm not good at all these things. So I would always bring people together from different disciplines and tell them, tell me your story. Teach me what you learned when you take something. Teach me what you learned when you study about the brain. Te you know, I just love learning from people. And when I went to TED in 1994, in the first five minutes of the first ever TED I attended, I thought, wow, I wish I could do this. You know, to have a dinner party of my own where I invite all the people that I would love to meet and have them tell stories, you know. And that was in 1994. And then I went off to all my other things. And then finally, when I started my own company, I really felt that we need to do this. And by then, TED has become cool now. I mean, in 94, nobody knew what TED was. But it has become cool. And uh, so I went to Chris, and I said, why don't I host TED India? And I felt totally stupid asking this. Because a lot of times, to ask for what you want feels really weird. It's sort of like, this is TED, and this is me. How can I ask that I would do TED India by me? You know, that's sort of how you think. But somehow if you can just stop yourself stopping you and ask, you see how others see you. Because I was seeing myself as me doing TED India. And TED was looking at me as Lakshmi doing TED India. So it was such different pictures. And when I went, Chris said, of course, we would love it if you do it. I was like, really? Oh, God, now we have to actually deliver on it. And then, you know, I figured I'll ask, and then you'll think, we'll have two, three years, and meanwhile, I'll have a staff. And then it's like, oh, we'll do it in like nine months. Oh, OK. And, but luckily, you know, this is where lining up with the right people comes in. You know, we're an amazing team at TED. We put together a great team at India. And we hosted the first ever TED in Asia, in India, last year. And we thought, I prayed that I said 300 people so we can break even and TED doesn't lose money on this because, you know, they're, they're, you know I'm sort of riding on their success. And we had over 1,000 people from 46 different countries. And Derek was there, Gino was there, and um, we had and Jay was there. And, and an amazing time. And what I realized at the end of it is that if you just allow for things to happen. If you can just tell people that this is what I want to do, help me. People are willing to do that for you. But a lot of times we talk ourselves out of it because we think it's stupid to do it. So, you know, I, I've said, okay, now we have done it. Now what can I do that's even more stupid and, uh, uh, you know, lose my sleep over it. So. I went to TED and said, you guys said you'll do one conference. We did it. We were successful. But I really want to do it every year. And Chris said, great, but we're not going to do it. You figure out how you want to do it. So I told them, okay, I will do it on my own. I'll find the resources on my own. But I want to be associated with you because I want to learn from you. That they know how to put on a great conference. They know how to distribute the content. I don't need to reinvent the wheel for that. So we are actually hosting, the, it, we're calling it the INC conference. INC stands for Innovation and Knowledge. And we're hosting it for the first time in India. And my dream is really to bring people from Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East together to showcase the way we think. Because one of the things I realized is that in the West, I've lived there for 26 years now, when you have a great idea, there's an infrastructure to go and implement it. But whereas when I come back to India, I realize that that infrastructure is not there. 
Because A, first we don't trust each other. If I share this, somebody might steal my idea. You know, that's the first thing that crosses your mind. Secondly, there isn't anybody to go to. There aren't new role models. So my whole journey now has become about redefining success and creating new role models out of the people we look at on a day-to-day -day basis. And to take the help from the best of the people in the world and make that vision come true. So the new thing I've coined is that my name is Lakshmi, which means wealth. And people often mistake wealth for money. Uh, but what I say is the true wealth is the wealth you create in terms of memories, in terms of moments. So, you know, to me, um, probably a meeting I had with Andy Grove, who was then the CEO of Intel, uh, where he threw me out of the meeting and I learned something out of it is worth a million dollars in the bank because that lesson I'll never forget. So I really feel that in the new world where the youth is a huge force, it is my duty to create a world where we have new role models. So that's what we are all about and we call it billionaire of moments. We say it's not about how much money you have in the bank, but how many moments you bank that matter in the long run. So we are all about creating a billionaire of moments and we want the conference that we do to create those moments that make each person a billionaire. And we need help from all of you because I really want the best minds from India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Singapore, Malaysia, um, Cambodia, China. I mean, we all should know each other. We all know our counterparts in the West, but we really don't know each other. So that's really is our journey, is that let's get everyone together and teach us how to do this. And I'm excited, you know, when I heard the musicians up here. You know, I just have goosebumps when I have moments like this because there's a doctor and an accountant and a philosophy major and a drummer and we are all those things and I think we learn from the youth on a daily basis. So I really want to welcome all of you to become billionaire of moments and help us make it a great success. Go to the inkconference.com. Yes, this is a pitch, but it's truly about making a difference and uh, uh, creating new role models. Thank you.